Once your blood runs orange and blue, orange and blue. 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 this, this is, the pod, is the pod for you. For you. You're listening to Orange and Blue Bloods, hosted by EJ Stewart and Tommy Beer. Let's get to it, New York. You like that? You like that? Do you like that? This is Orange and Blue Bloods, a New York Knicks podcast, a second round playoffs New York Knicks podcast. I am EJ Stewart, joined by Tommy Beer. We have so much to discuss on this lovely Thursday morning that we record because the Knicks are headed to the Eastern Conference semifinals. They beat the Cleveland Cavaliers in Cleveland in five games. Knicks in five. The prophecy was fulfilled. Shout out to our producer, Jimmy Jimmy Jackson, who posted that as the title for one of our other podcasts after game, I think two or three or four. Um, the prophecy was fulfilled. The Knicks win in five. They move on to the next round. So we will talk about how the Knicks got this win, what it means for the franchise now that they have gotten to the second round of the playoffs for the first time since 2013. And we'll talk about just what also kind of just wrapping a bow on this series as well and just kind of what we saw and, and what, what surprised us. It, it should be an uh, interesting discussion on that. We have to talk about one of the only negatives that came out of this win for the Knicks, Julius Randle re-injuring his ankle during this game. So we'll talk about what the latest is on that, how long he could be out, and what the Knicks will do if they do not have Julius Randle for part or some or maybe all of the next round in the playoffs. And we now know who the Knicks are actually going to play in the next round. So this is a very monumental podcast. Um, uh, The Miami Heat. Beat the Milwaukee Bucks, the number one seed team with the best record in the NBA. Beat them in Milwaukee to clinch their series in five games. So we have Heat. We have Knicks. If you grew up in the 90s or you know anything about those rivalries in the late 90s, you know what that means. This is a big-time rivalry and an important one for Knicks fans and a chance for the Knicks to go to Eastern Conference Finals. So we'll give you a very early preview of that. They will. Start that series Sunday, game one at Madison Square Garden. So a lot to get to today, Tommy, but today is indeed a good day. How you feeling? Yo, EJ, it's early in the morning. I know we don't usually record at this time, but I had this weird dream last night that like RJ Barrett outplayed Donovan Mitchell and, and, <laughs> and Mitchell Robinson established himself as like one of the best centers in the NBA and Jalen Brunson, the Jalen Brunson things and, and IQ had his game and like the Knicks won and then the Heat beat the Bucs in five, so the Knicks are going to have home court advantage in the second round of the Eastern Conference playoffs in a game that starts Sunday at the Garden, and they're going to be playing the Heat. Like, just uh, did that really happen? Like, that that did happen, right? It, it, it did happen. It, it's hard to believe because I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. A lot of things happened in the NBA last night that I'm still trying to wrap my head around. It was one of the wildest nights in the NBA, and it seems to be par for the course now with these playoffs. I mean, this has been a really wild couple of days in the NBA first round as opposed to and, 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 Well, the, the sad part is probably 5% of NBA fans got to see it because it happened that the, the, the Bucs yeah. was going on at 1230 on NBA oh, TV. Yeah. That's a story for another day. Let's talk <laughs> some Knicks basketball, EJ. Yeah, I'm still paying for those uh, late finishes, by the way, as we record this podcast on an early Thursday morning. So, again, this is Orange and Blue Bloods, a New York Knicks podcast, Odyssey, WFN original. You can get these podcasts wherever you get your podcasts, including the free Odyssey app. Make sure you hit, make sure you hit the auto-download feature on your streaming service so you get these episodes every time we drop. We drop three times a week. This is our final episode until, uh, quite frankly, next week when we have a recap of Game 1 of the Eastern Conference semifinals that we now know will be Knicks versus Heat. This is, again, surreal to say, but make sure you hit that auto-download feature to follow um, the Knicks playoff journey right here with Odyssey and WFAN. So let's begin with uh, the Knicks advancing to the Eastern Conference semifinals for the first time since 2013. New York took care of business in Game 5, defeating the Cleveland Cavaliers 106-95. Knicks took the lead in the first quarter and never relinquished it. It was thanks to a really great team effort, as Tommy mentioned. You had Jalen Brunson uh, leading the Knicks with 23 points. You had R.J. Barrett adding 21 points. You had Emmanuel quickly with a breakout game that Tommy predicted on this podcast earlier this week. He had 19 points. And then the front court. What a performance by the front court. First, Julius Randle, who did get injured, and we will talk about that soon. But 
bounce back performance for the game for the minutes he played 13 points 16 uh six minutes and 16 minutes uh, six assists i'm sorry in 16 minutes uh, before he left the game with the injury he was aggressive he let the game come to him and and he got everybody involved early i think he had five first quarter assists so really solid game from randall until he unfortunately got hurt and then obi Toppin steps in immediately changes the game in the third quarter he has 12 points off the bench and i think maybe the most inspired performance of this game came from mitchell robinson 13 points 18 rebounds, 11 offensive rebounds alone from Mitchell Robinson. He had some big putbacks. He created some second chance opportunities late in the fourth quarter that helped milk the clock. He was essential to the Knicks sealing this win. Um, so for the Cavs, they are eliminated from the playoffs in five games. The Cavs that learned last night from inside the NBA. Ernie Johnson had the stat. The Cavs have not won a playoff series without LeBron James since 1993. Um, a, a really astonishing style. I know they've been to the finals and won a championship, so it's not like they've had all pain during that time. But it's still crazy to think that a franchise uh, minus one player has not won a series um, since I was two years old. So th- that is a, that is where the Cavs are as they head into this offseason. Donovan Mitchell uh, finished this game uh, with 28 points. Uh, Darius Garden finished this game with 21 in the loss. So um, I'll start here. Tommy, how were the Knicks able to close out Cleveland in the fashion that they did? Oh, man, w- where to start? Um, you talked about Jalen Brunson. Uh, quite frankly, he was the best player in the series. Um, we talked about it often, and it's common NBA knowledge. The team with the best player often wins. That was the case in this series. Um, <laughs> it's funny, it, just before we get into all this stuff, I thought, like, uh, of all the happy fan bases – um, and Knicks and 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 the Heat, obviously, and and everything going on in the NBA. Like Donovan Mitchell should be really happy that the Bucks lost yeah. last night, and and Giannis conversation, and uh, there's so yeah. much to talk about that we like that it, it, any if this had happened like on a Tuesday and there weren't many other storylines, like there's not going to be a lot of rehashing of the of the trade. Everybody that bashed the Knicks for not trading for Donovan Mitchell. Um, but that, that should be said, and we'll have that conversation at some point. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, um, and, and looping that in, R.J. Barrett outplayed Donovan Mitchell the final three games um, of this series. Can't say enough about R.J. Um, really changed the calculus of this team when he plays at that level. Um, incredible to think that after he struggled, as bad as he played over the second half of the season, and really the, the most of the regular season in general, and then as poorly as he played in games one and two, for R.J. Barrett to bounce back and have the three best games of his NBA career in the three most important games of the Knicks season and his career, respectively, um, a testament to that kid's heart and guts. Um uh, you didn't even mention Obi Toppin. Um, you know, I, I that's your boy comes in yeah. the most important quarter of his entire season, maybe of his entire career. Um, closeout game on the road. The player that started ahead of him since he arrived in New York, injured and out. Um, Nick fans nervous. Huge 12 po- knocks down a three, gets to the basket, rebounds the basketball, inspired performance, incredible, um, you know, gut check game from Obi. Um, you know, t- 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 huge credit to him as well. Um, Josh Hart, what can you say about this guy? Yeah. Everything he does, um, 47 minutes in this one. Four, I mean, I, I, <laughs> he might be the best conditioned athlete in the sport, um, and that's yeah. not hyperbole. Um, strength, yeah. uh, uh, agility, endurance, uh, everything you could want. He is the quintessential New York Nick. Um, he has been the key component that kind of unlocked everything that we're seeing here. Um, but I think it's important to start with because we probably haven't given him as many flowers as we should have Mitchell Robinson. Um, he yep. dominated this series. He literally embarrassed Jared Allen. Um, you know, uh, 18, not only 18 rebounds, 11 on the offensive boards. Mitchell Robbins had had more offensive rebounds than Jared Allen and Evan Mobley had defensive rebounds combined. Um, that's that that's how you you sun people like he literally embarrassed that that front court um, dominated them in a way that that they didn't look prepared for. Um, and, and, you know, the, the thing that I kind of took away um, right from the start. I just had a feeling that this wasn't going to be the Cavs tonight. One, the arena was dead. I couldn't believe how yep. quiet that that arena was. Um, and the other thing was, it looked like they, the, the Cavs front court in particular, just had had enough of getting bullied and beaten yep. 
and physically dominated that they just waved the white flag and said, I don't, I don't want anymore. Like, I don't want to get back on the plane. I don't want to have to deal with Julius Randle going through my chest. I don't want to have to deal with Mitchell Robinson going over, jumping over the top of me and dunking on my brain. Like I, I just, if we lose, I'm okay with it because, and that was a really, really bad sign. I got that sense early on. And like, that's kind of the overarching theme I thought, um, you know, and, 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 and a lot of it has to do with the front court, just the physicality, uh, of the the of the Knicks overpowered Cleveland and it just it the, the series wasn't as close as like five games this game wasn't as close which is shocking yeah. to say um, because we all thought if the Knicks win it'll probably be in seven um, but yeah. just an incredible statement from the Knicks um, and uh, there there's reason to be really optimistic if you're a Knicks fan right now. Yeah, we'll hear from some Knicks here, but you mentioned the physicality and the physical dominance that the Knicks had, especially in the front court in this series. J.B. Bickerstaff agrees with Tommy that that was the difference in uh, this series. I mean, it's the physicality. Uh, I think that's, you know, when you look at even tonight, what they were trying to do, you know, in that first half, it was just put your head down and go to your spot. Right. That forced you into help. And now that was more kickouts. That was offensive rebounds. Um, you know, I also think, you know, give them credit for sure. Um, I thought, you know, Jalen Brunson obviously had a masterful series. Um, you know, their individual guys played to their strengths and knew how they needed to help. You know, that experience matters. Um, the experience that those guys have gained, you know, um, you know, Josh Hart and those guys like that experience and understanding of who they are and how they help when things are tough and, you know, gritty, um, you know, so, so give them a ton of credit for it. But, um, you know, when you lose the rebounding battle in every game that you lose um, and it's not from a lack of effort, you know, that's when the physicality comes into play. So their bigger staff right there saying it like, uh, you know, we lose the rebound battle every game. We're not the more physical team. And though if you lose every game, then that's kind of how you lose your series. So um, I, I agree. I think that this was, um, as I tweeted last night, I feel like I'm going to tell my kids about the series with Mitchell Robinson uh, completely dominated uh, Jared Allen. A lot of uh, Nick fans who've been through some lean years and one of the arguments we had to, latch on to because there wasn't much to talk about was that Mitchell Robinson was the best young center in New York, not Jared Allen at the time playing for the yeah. Brooklyn Nets. And the Nets were seen as this great young nucleus. I think so, I saw several people pulling back those tweets. I'm like, wow, a lot of receipts are being pulled. We're talking about the Mitchell Robinson, Jared Allen rivalry on that was only on an internet and only between Knicks and Nets Twitter at yeah. a very weird time for both of those organizations. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that Mitchell Robinson was absolutely phenomenal. And I think you're right. I think that, it was almost like there were a lot of, I think, football analogies I could use for this game. One on Mitchell Robinson, it was like, you know, trying to tackle Derrick Henry. You know, maybe you, you do a decent job for a couple quarters or even a three quarters. But after a certain point, when you see a guy who's just so relentless, just going after every ball and just push you around and bullying you around, at a certain point, you're going to let go of the rope. And when you combine that, and then you got Josh Hart flying around also, you got to try to handle him. And those guards got to try to follow him. It was just too much for Cleveland. And it really ended up being the focal point. A lot of the Cavs uh, writers who were following this series said the one to make worried about was the rebounding. And it ended up being probably the difference in this series. The other thing I thought that was crazy to me was that third quarter. Um, you know, Randall gets hurt. Um, he, he He's out of the game. They start the second half with Obi Toppin. And the Knicks actually end up expanding their lead. And one of the things I noticed, and I'm starting to see from this team, and I think it's trouble for opposing teams, is the difference in how the Knicks play when Randall is out there as a starter compared to when Obi is out there as a starter is night and day. And it doesn't necessarily mean it's better or worse, but I think for the Cavs, it was like a shell shock to like start that second half with Obi Toppin and then have the Knicks make it a track meet. Um, the first half, the Knicks were scoring the ball officially. They scored like 61 points, but they were still playing relatively in the half court. They were pushing when they can. Um, but, you know, how we know how Randall plays. He's more of a half court kind of player. Then they start the second half, and the ball is zipping around. They're flying up and down. Obi's getting leaking out for, 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 uh, for uh, you know, uh, breakaway dunks. And now they blink, and they're down 16. Like, it's like when you're playing in the NFL or in college or any football, 
and used to playing, you know, a pro style team. And then at halftime, they changed the quarterback. And now they're running like the spread. And you're like, whoa, we didn't we didn't anticipate this. We weren't prepared for this. You know, how do we adjust here? And the Cavs just, they took too long to adjust to how the Knicks were playing. They were playing a completely different brand of basketball in that third quarter. And it ended up costing this game. I think that the Cavs probably thought, okay, oh, you ran a lot. We're going to find a way to sneak our way back in here. And they tried a couple of times. But that start to the third quarter, which Obi scored all the points. And he scored like, I think, seven or eight points in a row. Um, that, that, that ended up kind of really, you know, putting the game away, Cleveland will creep back in, but they couldn't get close enough to really make it interesting. Agreed. I thought that that start of the third quarter was huge because if there was any, you know, Cavs could latch on to the hope. Okay. Randall's this is the that kind of changes, you know, cause there was one moment when there's a big swing in the series, maybe this is yeah. it. Um, we'll go on a run here. Um, but yes, it just, it, it didn't have it. Um, and, you know, using to, to, to further your football analogy, a lot of that had to do with the fact that Donovan Mitchell could not get on track. And, a, and that would, the primary reason for that was, was Josh Hart. Um, oh, he's yeah. talking about how he envisions himself as a linebacker. Um, you know, he could have played football and that's, and, th- and that's what he did. He just didn't give Donovan Mitchell any breathing room. The shots that the Cavs had to make were difficult. IQ tremendous defensively um, when he came in on Darius Garland. Darius Garland played well um but had to make difficult shots um and and the other thing was just the depth the Knicks depth despite being down two starters had better depth yeah. you know the Cavs had to turn to Lamar Stevens I mean it was desperate uh, yeah. times um and a lot of that again has to do with the fact when you trade multiple young assets and draft picks and so you don't have draft capital to make a trade at the deadline for one player the upside is you get a player that can score 38 points in a game one game. The downside is when you need that depth over the course of a long playoff series, you, you, you likely don't have it unless you get, you know, you, you, hit, you hit, you know, a couple lottery tickets at the end of the roster. And, and the Cavs certainly have not done that, um, even though they got decent minutes from Isaac Okoro. Um, yeah. It, it yeah. wasn't enough, you know. Yeah. And that was that J.B. Bickerstaff's coaching in this playoff series was not I, great to I, say I, I said I, I the, the Cavs the Donovan Mitchell should be happy that the Bucks lost JB Bickerstaff should be happy that the Bucks yeah. lost as well because coach Bud probably coached his last game in Milwaukee last night that was a yep. disaster um and because yeah. of that you know JB will probably fly under the radar but he got thoroughly out coached by Tibbs this year he did a terrible job yeah I don't know what he was doing I mean as soon as I saw him I put in lineups out there that had Osman and uh, Okoro and Danny Green playing at the same time I, I was like I mean is he waving the white flag? Like, does he think that this is like a December regular season game? And ironically, that lineup actually didn't play that terrible. But almost the principle in the matter was just like, how do you put a lineup out there with those guys, three guys who are essentially non-threats offensively, at least with the ball in their hands and any kind of defense on them? And you have two of your best players, three best scorers on the bench in a game where you're down. Like, I, 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 I could not fathom what he was doing on that other side. So. And then he throw in Lamar Stevens late because they're just now searching for answers. I, I mean, he he did not have a good series. So um, so he he and the rest of the Cavs will go home. A difficult end for them. Before we get to the Randall injury, um, I really feel like the Knicks offense really turned a corner, really probably since game four, and that carried into game five. Particularly, this was, I think, their best offensive performance. Uh, I don't know if this was the most points they scored, but I think given – how they got finally what we were talking about really in the last episode, like a game where a lot of other players were able to support Jalen Brunson. It wasn't just one guy. Like these games, it's kind of been one guy or maybe one and one and a half. Maybe the other guy gets like 15, another guy gets 20. Like this was a game where you saw the Knicks, why they were one of the most efficient offensive teams in the NBA. Um, again, uh, Barrett uh, quickly having that breakout game. Obi Toppin comes off the bench. Randall looked like he was going to break through, which is so frustrating that now he didn't get hurt. And then Mitchell Robinson adds 13 points with those 18 rebounds. Do you feel like the Knicks offense has turned a corner uh, in this postseason, given what you saw uh, on uh, Wednesday night? Of all the crazy, unpredictable, like unbelievable things, like imagine I told you the before the series, Knicks win in five. Then I tell you that the Knicks win game five in a closeout game in Cleveland, in which in the second half, Julius Randle scores zero points because he's hurt. Jalen Brunson goes two of 11. This yeah. is maybe the worst half he's played, you know, uh, of the series. 
and the Knicks still outscore the Cavs in that second half to win game five in a closeout game in Cleveland. Um, it just, it, it really is remarkable. And again, a lot of that has to do with um, RJ Barrett, uh, again, tremendous. Uh, and just the, the all around, uh, you know, the, the versatility, Emmanuel quickly, um, you know, again, he stepped up and, and Obi Toppin was the Knicks leading scorer in the second half. Um, yes, the, the, to, to your point, um, the change of pace that picks up uh, Hart and, and Obi are a perfect combination alongside yeah. each other, um, looking at gun outlet passes to each other uh, consistently. Um, you know, that and, and that was one of the things. How are the Knicks going to score against this top ranked Cleveland defense? One of the ways was take care of the basketball. Just 10 turnovers last night. We've talked about the rebound advantage. Another secret sauce thing is the Knicks taking care of the basketball. Well, um, again, just 10 turnovers. Um, and the other thing that we found that, that they took advantage of in the series was getting easy buckets before Cleveland was able to set. A lot of that has to do with Josh Hart. Every time mm-hmm. the Knicks got a turnover this entire series, they looked for yeah. Josh Hart, wherever he was. Here, you go and, and figure it out. Um, yeah. You know, anytime they got a long rebound, Josh Hart and pushed the pace. And it's just kind of contagious. Um, and Obi, Obi obviously fed into it. Um, so, yeah, that's, you know, we'll, we'll see. We'll talk about Randall next. Um, we'll see how he yeah. comes back. But um, even when Brunson struggles, um, you know, Hart is kind of a piece that unlocks so much. IQ, you know, can step in and step up. Obi presents a different dynamic. Hartenstein, a, a versatile offensive player. Mitch Rob crashing the offensive glass. 11 offensive rebounds by one player. I mean, that's 11 possessions. It's huge in, in, yeah. in, in a game. Um, and it'll be even more important um, in the Miami series when the scores are even, you know, because Miami struggles uh, offensively as well. So um, just, a, again, a lot to like. A, you know, um, it, this game is is important for a number of specs, but, you know, it, it, it Instead of having to play game six at home with a gimpy Randall and or no Randall, now you buy yourself four extra days of rest and you, you have game one instead of a game six. So, um, you know, it just it really, really impressive all around victory from the Knicks. It definitely was. Uh, before we get to Randall, I will give Tom to the final word on uh, kind of what this win means for the franchise and what this win means for the city. I think, you know, and I've said this many times that, uh, the tradition of the Knicks, what what it le- uh, means not only to the city but the league, uh, and we have what I feel are the best fans in the world. We have the best city in the world, the best arena in the world, and I think that the way this team plays, it resonates with with all our fans. They play hard, they they play smart, and they play together. And I think if you do that in New York, it'll be it's it's always recognized. It, um, so it, it's good. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done. Uh, we have a lot of areas to improve upon. So we're looking forward to the next challenge. Knicks move on to win uh, that series. They got, now go on to the Eastern Conference semifinals. So let's quickly talk about Randall. He was unable to finish game five of coming down on Karis Levert's foot, reactivating an ankle injury that sidelined him for the final two plus weeks of the regular season. Randall had uh, trouble getting off the floor before eventually limping to the locker room under his own power. He would come out at halftime uh, or after halftime to watch the second half of the game, but he watched it essentially from the stands. He wasn't even on the bench. Obi Toppin at the second half played great, uh, provided the Knicks a spark. After the game, uh, Thibodeau said that it was premature to, to kind of prognosticate what Randall's situation will be moving forward, but that he'll be reevaluated sometime Thursday, which is the day we're recording this podcast. So, one, how can the Knicks, in your eyes, Tommy, adjust to Randall possibly being out? And how many games could they afford him to not play if they want to advance past the Heat? Yeah, so a, a couple things. One, the fact that he came back on the court, good sign. Um, yeah. You know, they, they, they kind of showed him, you know, doing some some calf raises, um, you know, during timeouts and stuff like that. So just the fact that he felt comfortable enough, they didn't need to immediately, you know, air cast it or anything along those right. lines. Yeah. When he Wasn't first went down. Boot? Yeah. Exactly. When he first went down, it looked scary. It looked like he was scared. He looked to the bench immediately. It just looked very familiar to the to the injury that cost him five games. Um, I'm sure he was initially very concerned. Um, it looked like he was a little bit, um, a little more comfortable. He was able to walk off the floor under his own power, obviously limping. Um, the other thing is uh, Ian Begley of SNY did report um, that Randall was walking cautiously. Um, but according to league sources, the early impression is the sprain is not as severe as Randall's prior ankle ankle ailment. Um, so it kind of you know confirms the eye test. Um, who knows? 
We'll see how he, obviously it depends on it. He's he's going to be getting, you know, therapy 23 at 24 hours a day, um, yeah. you know, for, for the next 48 hours, 72 hours, whatever the case might be. Um, we'll see how his ankle responds. Again, this is the same ankle. They got to be careful with it. They may err on the side of caution. Um, one thing to keep in mind, the schedule is set uh, Sunday game one. I don't, do they have the time yet? I, I saw one. I didn't see. I, yeah, I didn't. I didn't see the time when it first happened. But I'm assuming it'll be one. That's usually when they start those game ones. I, I assume it'll be seven later yeah, in the afternoon or evening. Agreed. I assume that it'll either be one or three thirty. Um, but they'll yeah. probably have the West Coast game at three thirty. So I assume it'll be one o'clock on Sunday at the Garden. And folks, the Garden will be very loud. Um, oh God. So, um, so then you have the game Tuesday, and then but then you don't play again. I believe the the, the yeah, following one o'clock by the way, the official time. Okay, good. Um, and then the, the the next game is Saturday. Is that correct? Have they? The, it goes from Tuesday to Saturday, or Tuesday to Friday? Um, what for the for the for game for game three? Three. I let me let me see. I have it right here. So the Knicks they'll play Sunday, Tuesday, and then Saturday. Exactly. Saturday. Okay. So that's something to keep in mind as well. If you if you hold them out till Saturday, that's a good you know t- ten days of 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 a full nine days of a full rest and recuperation. Um, it sounds like he could probably play in game one. Do they do they let him suit up in game one? I guess we'll we'll get a feel of after practice on Friday and, and Saturday, etc. Um, but those are some kind of the options. If it was more severe, um, you know, given what you can get from Obi, keeping him out that that full week um, might make some sense based on the gap. Um, between games two and three. So something to keep in mind. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. As far as the um, the X's and O's, should he not be able to play? Um, the, obviously, Obi, you know, take take center stage. Yeah. Um, you, you, there's a little bit of a different offensive feel we talked about in the first segment. Um, push that pace a little more. Uh, get Obi some easy buckets in transition. Get Obi some, some three-pointers. Also have him create a little bit more, um, you know, go into the basket. We've seen a couple times in the series now. We've put the ball on the floor, get to the rim. Um, would like to see that a little more. Um, and then you're just going to have to rely a little bit more heavily on your other guys, the the Brunsons, the the, the Barretts, uh, Hearts, IQs, et cetera. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays itself out. Um, the other thing I just, you know, kind of thought of randomly, Sims has not been available. Maybe does, does he yeah. get some minutes if, if Randall's, um, you know, he could give you, you know, a good six minutes against Bam at some point just to kind of wear him down a little bit um so you know we'll, we'll see how that plays out but uh something to keep in mind yeah that 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 sentence part is is, interesting, is a good point because I, I didn't even know he was like not available to like yeah. uh, this series and then they was like oh he's got a shoulder injury he's not even suited up so um so yeah that was uh so that was that was that will be interesting to see if he ends up getting some time here so it's so weird because i think I, you know we came into this postseason with randall being a question mark and feeling like man nick's they will have a really tough time if Randall can't play in the series against Cleveland. Uh, he did play in this series. He didn't play particularly well for the majority of the series, and the Knicks still won in five games. Uh, the Heat are a different animal than the Cavs, especially when it comes to dealing with physicality. They will be way more equipped than the yes. uh, Cavs were. So, so there's a part of me that says, okay, Randall can't play. This feels like it would still be tough. But like I said in the last segment, like – the Knicks play so different when Obi Toppin's out there. And at a certain point, I got to start believing what my eyes are telling me, that <laughs> Obi Toppin can go out there and give you similar, similar production to what Julius Randle can give you if he plays the kind of minutes. Maybe he won't rebound as well. And he has some defensive lapses in that third quarter that were annoying. But And, and like, Randle does have defensive lapses. But there's some lapses that happen, like, because he's just not focused, where Randle sometimes, I think, if he picks his spots when he's on the defense. So, so it's not like it's just like you're getting it same all NBA caliber player, but I just don't know if I can say, oh, the Knicks are going to be in this like disastrous situation if Randall has to miss some games. I, I got to be honest. Um, I will, I will say, I think the fact that the Heat don't have won't have Hero is an important factor in this as well when it comes to exactly how many points do you need to score to beat the Miami Heat. The Heat. Offense looks really good against the Milwaukee Bucks. I, I, I the Bucks have a great defense. I don't know. I don't know what happens to the Bucks, and we'll talk about them in a second. But I would think that this is going to be, I agree, kind of a low scoring kind of series. So I think the Knicks may be able to survive missing Randall for a couple of games if they have to. They might be in a weird position where they might need to try to see, hey, we can get split these first two games in Miami if Randall can't play these first two games, and then say, okay. You know, you don't want to have a split, but then Randall comes back for game three and game four. He's like, okay, now we got to get the split in Miami, Randall playing. I think they feel good about their chances in that regard. They are the higher seed. 
I will say this um, in regards to Obi specifically before we move on to the other matchups and yeah. whatnot. The the uh, heat the heat starting uh, Kevin Love at power forward. First of all, you think that Cavs could have used Kevin Love um, in, uh, in this in this at the yeah, like, he had like eleven or twelve rebounds last night. Yeah, fifteen to twelve, <laughs> definitely. Yeah, well, you know, um, I will say, but Kevin Love is the type of player Obi can guard perimeter based. Ke- Kevin Love's yep. not you know pounding you, taking it back to the basket and driving past you. He's, right. He's hitting spot up threes off space yeah. off Jimmy Butler and Kyle Lowry kickouts, etc. Um, so it's not like it's Pascal Siakam who could score forty on Obi's head um, and, and really you know take advantage of of Obi's defensive deficiencies. Love's a guy that's going to look to draw fouls on the draw charges on on one end of the floor and then shoot threes uh, from the corner and the wings on the other uh, on the other end of the floor. So Obi can stay um, attached to perimeter players. So that's a, that works the Knicks advantage as well. Um, not having a you know. He, he, Obviously, love is not a focal point of of the uh, uh, of the uh, the Heat offense, especially in the way that the, you know that that they that he he does score. Um, he contributes offensively, but it's more from the perimeter. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, boy, you talk about Kevin Love and and his impact in that Heat series and how he played against the box and the Cavs not being able to rebound. You do kind of wonder, man, <laughs> maybe the Cavs could have used him but you're right i think that that's a good matchup for the knicks with kevin love playing so many minutes um not as athletic as well so knowing yeah. uh unless maybe maybe they put bam on ob is now, now we're getting this is where it gets fun now you're talking about how yes. teams miss a match but in theory if it if they do say you know bam's gonna deal with uh mitch robinson on the glass and then you have love on ob top and that end up that may end up being actually Maybe even bigger mismatch than even Randall because Love's not gonna run up and down the floor. With Obi. Yeah, you want you want to put Obi in 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 a pick and roll action and in, in screen yeah. action. Get try to get Kevin Love moving. That's a uh, they actually did run some five four Mitchell Robinson yeah. Obi pick and rolls top of the key um, uh, against the Cavs. I'd love to see that. Um, you know, should should Randall not be available, or even if he is, if those two share the floor together or Hartenstein, um, because if Love is trying to guard. Obi, you want to use your agility, athleticism to your advantage because that's where Love is has a major disadvantage. Yeah, overall, I, I, I the Knicks, it, it would be great if they can get Randall back healthy. There, I would feel like they would need him, but today I can't say that they can't advance without him. I cannot say that after what I've seen because all the narrative after those, after what I saw last season. Remember, I'm not going back to last season. Wait, Obi finished the season. It was well end of the season. Teams are tanking. You can't take that. And I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. Basketball, basketball. But okay, fine. Then the end of this season, same thing happens. Now Knicks are trying to clinch a playoff spot, uh, finish the season strong. And it was the same thing. Ah, oh, well, you know, it's still end of the season. Even though the Knicks games matter, uh, still end of the season. Other teams are tanking. So I'm like, okay, fine. Now I've seen the playoffs. <laughs> Obi top in the minutes he plays when Randall was playing and struggling. Uh, he helped carry the Knicks past the series. Then in this game where Randall gets hurt and then he dominates the third quarter. First of all, I think Thibodeau should have put him back in. I thought that was a minor mistake in that fourth quarter. That's when the Knicks were struggling offensively. But um, he plays the way he did in that third quarter in a playoff game against a team that's facing elimination. And... Uh, there's no excuses anymore. I, I expect Obi Toppin to play well if he has to step if he had to start for Randall. I don't think that there's this huge drop off. The other thing to to it's really important to note is Randall played really well in that first half. It was great to see yep. aggressive driving through people's chest. Had five assists like in the first nine minutes. Um, really played smart, played well. Um, even though his shot wasn't dropping, contributed significantly. That being said, the first four games he was bad. Um, you know, yeah. he was he was averaging 14.8 points, slashing 32, 26, 64, and had four more turnovers than assists. Um, yeah. and, I, and I did look up the numbers actually uh, c- coming into um, game five um, on Tuesday. I wrote about it. according to basketball reference over 40 years, 898 players have attempted at least 100 field goals in their postseason career. Of those 898 players, Randall has the lowest cumulative field goal percentage. Um, the only guy, only other guy shooting wow. below 31% for their postseason careers, nine games uh, for Randall, um, are Lindsey Hunter and Chris Duhon. So Randall was not an efficient offensive yeah. player and was not, you know, wasn't like he was a key to the Knicks getting a 3 1 lead. Um, so could Obi likely wouldn't play worse, would be more efficient offensively. Um, you assume Randall's going to bounce back. You saw him bounce back in the first half of game five. And again, they, I, they, they have a better chance to beat the heat um if if we're a fully healthy julius randall but it's i agree with you the knicks can still win the series if randall doesn't play or misses the first two games etc yeah so let's let's get to this heat series before we get out of here so 
Uh, again, we know who the Knicks will be playing in the next round of the playoffs. The Miami Heat became just the sixth team in NBA history to beat a number one seed in the first round of the playoffs. The Heat beat the Bucs in overtime, 128-126, overcome a 16-point fourth quarter deficit. The Heat were able to send the game into overtime thanks to a Jimmy Butler circus uh, layup out of a side out of bounds play. Uh, they were then able to hang on in overtime despite losing them out of bio. Kevin Love and Kyle Lowry to foul trouble. All three guys fouled out. Jimmy Butler out there by himself still found a way to beat the Milwaukee Bucks at full strength. Butler finished the game with 42 points. Um, so that is now the matchup. Knicks Heat. Knicks won the season series three to one. Each game was decided by single digits. Several of these games decided by the last possession. Two games. Just two points were the difference in two of the uh, Nick wins in this uh, season series. The Heat will come in to this series without Tyler Hero. He broke his hand. They also won't have Victor Oladipo. Very unfortunate injury, him tearing his patella tendon. Uh, he's had some knee problems. I'm actually a little worried this might be the end of his career. So shout out to Victor Oladipo. He's had a great run as an NBA player. So early thoughts on this Knicks Heat matchup in terms of key components key matchups what, what are you looking at when you see these two teams now officially set the square off sunday game one i i think my question is what happened in, in the first round series was it the bucks and and just falling apart and obviously Giannis not playing for a significant portion but he did come back um they were only three in the games he played the heat were the worst offensive team in the nba during the regular season they were the second best they are the second best offensive team in the postseason averaging 119 points uh per 100 possessions and it's an astonishingly high number uh better than the nuggets only behind only the phoenix suns um you know just just scoring the ball at will hero not being in the game you think that would slow them down or hurt them already uh, an offensively you know struggling team um but they just move the ball so crisply um we're going to talk about spo plenty over the next two weeks probably the best x's and o's coach in the sport um you badly out coach bud in that in that series um so those are the things we'll talk about um you know it just it, the thing that i actually woke up thinking about randomly and i'm interested to hear your thoughts on this ej yeah. Do you start Quentin Grimes um, if he's healthy mm. enough to return, or do right. you leave Josh Harden in the lineup? My initial thinking um, is I, I'm going to leave Harden in the starting lineup primarily because of this matchup. I'm going to match Josh Hart's minutes with Jimmy Butler's minutes uh, for the next seven games, 48 minutes a night, no matter how, how yeah. often they have to play. Hart's my heart and my soul of this team. Um, the the Bucks have really good defenders. Drew Holiday's one of the best of you know you know uh, defensive you know defensive player of the year candidate every year. He's healthy. Giannis has won defensive player of the year. Brook Lopez was a finalist for defensive player this year. The thing they don't have is a wing, and Jimmy Butler abused yeah. them. Um, uh, you know, down the stretch. Uh, for the, the final few games of the series, the Knicks have Josh Hart, um, yeah. and that and that is you know we, we, we Josh Hart is going to go from guarding Donovan Mitchell. Tibbs kind of matched up his minutes. You know he took Hart out for the only minute he rested was essentially the only couple minutes uh, Mitchell was out. Um, I could see him doing the same. I, I feel confident in throwing Grimes at him for a few minutes here and there. Yeah. If Hart gets into foul trouble or he wears down, um, because Grimes is that good of a, and physical a defender. Um, but Josh Hart may be ideally suited as as any player in the league. Um, because nobody's stopping play of Jimmy when he's when he's play of Jimmy. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and he's been a monster. So so all credit to him. Um, you know, he's a Nick nightmare right now. Um, but if anybody can do it, you know Josh Hart's gonna get be up to the challenge, you know, he's gonna embrace the challenge. Um, so uh that's something that I think, but it'll be very interesting to see what, what Tips does there. Yeah, the the heart starting question is going to be an interesting one. I mean, I feel like it's been a kind of elephant in the room since he got here. Yeah. Um, I, I feel like I think you probably have to start him because of how the heat or Jimmy's on right now. And to feel like I don't want to hit seat. I want to give myself the best chance in game one and how it starts to not let yes. him get going. Cause yes. there's probably the time he will get going. I yes. cannot let it be in game one. And right. he, he goes on a six, seven game heater. So I think because of that, you say I Josh Hart getting his chest in the minute that uh, yep. tip goes off and yep. we're going to go. I do worry about what that means for Quentin Grimes. I think it's somewhat unpredictable. Like there was a fear I had that like, if you move Quentin to the bench, maybe that hurts his confidence. Maybe he doesn't now give you the offensive output that you expect from him. Quite frankly, in the playoffs, he's given you zero offensive output. Exactly. I, I don't know if you're, you know, you're going from zero to zero. From does defensive effort. He's always going to give you hustle. So 
Um, he's not giving you nothing. He's always going to be worth some minutes out there. So I, I think at this point, I think I would agree. I think I would start um, Josh Hart. Uh, he best be the way he's shooting the ball too. He's shooting the ball better than Quentin Grimes, quite frankly. So yeah, I think that's probably the move they're going to have to go with. And I think that matchup between Jimmy Butler and Josh Hart will probably decide the series because this is not again going to be a series where there's going to be a lot of offense. I think that um, these are going to be defensive struggles. And if the I expect Jalen Brunson to play well, I don't. You know, uh, Gabe Vincent, good defender, but Brunson's had his way with him in this in this regular season. I don't expect that to change. Um, I think if the Knicks can just keep Jimmy Butler closer to his averages, don't let him have, you know, two or three 40, 50 point games like he had against the Bucs, I think that's how the Knicks win the series. Agreed. And the other thing with Grimes is he wasn't getting field goal attempts when he was on that, you know, alongside yeah. Brunson and starters, yeah. And Barrett, so maybe move it to the second unit. Might him get some more looks. Um, see how he, if he can develop some chemistry with IQ and 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 uh, uh, you know uh, Hartenstein and and Obi, you know, running up and down the floor. If Randall's healthy. Um, so those are those are some of the things I think that 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 why it makes sense. Um, again, we got to see if he's healthy. We still don't know if he's he's you know he's, he obviously missed the last couple games of the Cleveland series. Um, we should, you know it's, it's, uh, the latest report was he was out of his sling, so it looks like he's trending in the right direction. Um, yeah. You know, so hopefully. Ideally, hope he's healthy, so you have that option. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't worry too much about the the ego pride stuff with with Grimes. I think he'll understand that that heart was a key component, um, to, you know, to winning the series. He's a young kid, um, you know, he, he has to earn his minutes, etc. Um, and I think that might be a way to slow him back. But yeah, I agree with you. Even like the you know, somebody says, ah, you know, let Grimes get out there, and you don't want to you know mess up the sure, you know man. the chemistry the starters had. Like that first six minutes might decide the first game. And like again, this is the time of yeah. year we don't play around. Um, don't let Jimmy get hot. Um, you know, make if he makes shots, make them contested shots um, because he's he's capable again of, of going on one of those those heaters that they, they listen. He carried the heat to the finals previously on a heater, so it, yeah. it's not. Yeah, yeah, Knicks don't want to. They, I mean, they will. They will see play of Jimmy at some point in this series. Yes. The 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 important thing is to try to limit how many times this uh, persona makes a, an appearance. You know, you limit it to a half, limit it to yeah. one game. What yes. it can't happen is what happened in the Milwaukee series, where essentially there were like three playoff Jimmy games, and that's why the Heat are now in the next round. The Bucks are going home. Um, I think the Knicks are better equipped to face this team if we're going on a prediction because we kind of have to give one. This is the last episode we have until uh, game one is finished. I think the Knicks will win this series. I think Randall will come back and play some factor. I don't know if he plays the first two games. But I think the Knicks win this series in six. I've thought since every time I've seen these teams play, the Knicks look like the better team. The one game the Heat won, it felt the Knicks played terrible in the second half. Like I, 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 If the Knicks lost this series, I'm not going to say I'd be – he shot a different animal in the playoffs. I just don't know, considering um, some of the injuries they have, some of the long minutes some of these other guys are playing, I, I just think the Knicks' death will eventually get the better of them. Um, and, I, and I think the fact that the, 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 the Heat may be riding a little bit high. I know that they have big aspirations despite being an eight seed, but you go up against the Bucs, the team that you know knocked you out the playoffs uh, not that long ago. They got swept by the Bucs a couple of years ago. Like This is a matchup that always is, is something that they get up for. And while it's Knicks Heat, it is a rivalry. And I think that Tom Tipper will be able to explain that to those guys. I, I We'll see if Spoelstra can get that kind of motivation into the Heat. Um, he was, you know, he's been around Pat Riley. He knows the history as well. But I, I just think that this is going to be a series where the depth gets the better of them and the Knicks win in six games. Agreed. Um, I got the Knicks winning the series as well. I think it probably could go seven. Um, I think game one's really important. Um, the Heat coming off, as you mentioned, coming off a high, um, not just beating the number one seed, but the way they did it, the incredible comeback in, in game four, the unbelievable comeback in game five, um, the, the Jimmy Butler post route um, at the rim uh, to, to send it into overtime and then win it overtime. So if you could jump on the Heat right from the start, Garden's going to be yeah. insane Sunday. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, before they kind of get their footing and prepare, um, you know, for, for this next series, but Spo will have some wrinkles, et cetera. Um, it's really important to get that game one and kind of set the tone and say, Hey, this is not the Bucks team. You just played. We're here. We're for real. Um, and obviously just having a one game advantage um, is huge. Um, and you, and you got to win your home games in the postseason. So um, I think that'll go a long way towards setting tone. And yeah, just looking at the, 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 the series as a whole, 
when the Heat go to their bench and, and the Knicks go to the bench, we talked about it, um, you know, the, 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 the huge advantage, especially if you have a healthy Grimes, um, you know, with IQ and Hardenstein and, and just everything that that the, that the second unit can, can bring um, and, and kind of maintain that level. Um, you know, the, the Heat basically have some bench unit guys in their starting lineup. So there's just there's just I just don't see the Heat being able to um, deal with uh, the Knicks constantly leaning on them. Jabbing, jabbing, punching them. Um, you know, and we know how physical New York's going to play. Um, I don't think that the Heat are going to be able to withstand that. Yeah, I agree. I think that the Heat have they 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 had. They, I mean, it's, it's a testament to how great Coach Eric Spolster is. A testament yeah. to how great player Gene Butler is that they yes. will do what they did to the Bucks. I just think as the playoffs go on, they kind your wars show more and more. I think the Bucks in their inability to kind of get out of their own way in this series allowed the Heat to kind of hide a lot of their warts. I think yes. it's crazy I'm going to say it. I think there's going to be a difference in coaching level from Coach Bud to yep. uh, Tom Thibodeau. I mean, I know Bud has a championship, but, I mean, that guy is going into the offseason and maybe into a new job with three timeouts in his pocket. I mean, not call a timeout after <laughs> after Jimmy Butler ties a game with 0.9 seconds left to advance the ball. And oh it's actually just punt to overtime. Oh Incredible. And then to watch Grayson Allen drill the clock out oh in overtime uh, with two timeouts in your pocket, it, it's dumbfounding. It's dumbfounding. And I, like, I criticized Thibodeau a lot. Uh, last night was a night where I was thankful Tom Thibodeau was Knicks head coach. And then those are words I don't know if I thought I'd ever say, at least not since he won coach of the year. I said that watching both of those games, both the Knicks winning and then watching what Coach Bud could did because that was – uh, mile practice at the highest order. So the coaching match will be important. I think the Knicks will be prepared and uh, it should be a good series. Uh, Knicks heat. I, it's my favorite rivalry in the NBA. I know it's been dormant, but you can't tell me that those four years in a row, those two teams played every single playoffs was not some of the most intense basketball, maybe not the prettiest or the most well-played, but the most intense and physical basketball that you've ever seen. So I'm excited to get it reignited. Yeah, listen. If you're a script writer and you're, you know, if you if you're if you, if, you, if you're Hollywood and you want and you're looking for a Nick fan kind of script, it's Donovan Mitchell embarrass him and beat up the oh, Cavs yeah. in the first round. Riley next on the checklist, knock him out in round two, um, and then see whether it's Philly or Boston. But yeah, I, I, it has. There's a lot of '99 vibes, you know, like oh, yeah. kind of kind of hanging here. You know, when I I thought Mitchell Robinson's play reminded me of Marcus Camby during that that '99 run. Um, and you know, so we'll see. Uh, it, it'll definitely be interesting and exciting and give us plenty to talk about. It definitely will, but that'll do it for this episode of Orange and Blue Bloods, a New York Knicks podcast, Odyssey WF, an original podcast you can get wherever you get your podcasts, including the free Odyssey app. Make sure you hit the auto download feature on your streaming service to get these episodes every time we drop. We drop three times a week, so we'll be back following game one. Um, we'll be back on Monday to recap game one, tell you guys how everything went down. Also, be sure to check us out on YouTube. I didn't mention that top of the show, but you can find us both on the Odyssey Sports channel and the WFAN channel to watch the video podcast of these episodes. So, Tommy, let people know where they can find you. At Tommy Beer on Twitter, and enjoy this weekend, Nick fans. Yes, definitely enjoy it, Nick fans. You can find me, EJ underscore Stewart on Twitter, Action EJ on Instagram and TikTok. Thank you guys once again for checking us out. We'll see you next week. Go Knicks. Peace. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel for more content like this. If you want to see more of our videos, be sure to check out our playlist and let us know what you think in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow us on social media to stay up to date on our latest podcast ventures. Um, links will be in the descriptions. And as always, thanks for watching and we will see you in our next video.